How do you follow God's will? Do you obey God? Do you believe God? Do you care about what God cares about? Or do you have any other notion of God's will or perhaps no notion at all? Let's talk about this. I am Andris Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. A series of videos about wondrous wisdom, uh, a language of wisdom, of cognitive frameworks that I've been working on for 40 years. And uh, within that series, I've made uh, quite a few videos about the meaning of life. And those videos are um, relating uh, to very basic structures. One is a learning cycle where we take a stand, follow through, and reflect. And the other is four levels of knowledge. Uh, whether, what, how, why. Whether being the most narrow, it's knowledge of nothing. And then what is knowledge of something? How is knowledge of anything? And why is the broadest? That's knowledge of everything. And I've been studying this for 40 years. These are like building blocks of absolute truth, uh, frameworks that we just can't escape. Uh, so if you've seen uh, any of these videos, then you know that they come together uh, in the ways it described in these uh, systems of values. So Plato talks about uh, justice, and uh, we internalize that as obeying, or as he might say, moderation. And then when we feel beauty, which is uh, basically what wisdom feels like to the philosopher kings and queens, then we are courageous. Uh, we have our, uh, we're able to give up our lives uh, for, for what is right. So with uh, St. Paul, it's uh, not uh, about justice, it's about loyalty uh, to God and that we internalize as believing, as faith. And then when we have these uh, wonderful feelings of uh, love, then that uh, yields hope. And finally, uh, rounding this out, because these are permutations of a three cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting. Well, this happens to be my system of values, uh, where it's all about duty, but internalizing that as caring. And so that uh, when we feel uh, intimacy, then we respond by being honest. So I've talked about this, and um, the crucial thing here is um, that uh, this, uh, well, the crucial thing is that it's meaningful. It says that internalizing our worldview, claiming, uh, you know, taking up, uh, um, having uh, that attitude is really what it's about. And then through these structures, what does that lead to? What adds, what gives that meaning, right? How does God respond? How does God immortalize uh, the beautiful, wonderful uh, feelings in life, the positive emotions, which are wonderful but fleeting? How do they become immortalized in terms of the virtues of our soul that are indestructible, that never go away, you know, the, where we really shine? Uh, so our honesty, our hope, our courage. And so... What I want to talk about with this video is um, more um, just observations about parts of these uh, structures. So you can see there's four groups of three. You know, we can look at uh, duty, loyalty, and justice. Uh, we can also look at caring, believing, obeying. We can look at intimacy, love, and beauty. We can look at honesty, hope, and courage. And part of the uh, wonderful wisdom about that is that if we find three of those, then the other ones come for free, you see. We can wonder, hmm. You know, so if you see duty, loyalty, justice, you can say, well, those are external perspectives. How are those being internalized? as inner perspectives, uh, internal perspectives, caring, believing, obeying. So this is part of a long series. Um, 
and where I introduced it, and then I talked a lot about the threesome and the foursome. And then I talked even more about how they're intertwined in these value systems. So it says the third uh, section, but actually it was four different episodes, about an hour each. So now we're wrapping it up. Now we're on the fourth uh, part where it says further grounding the concepts, beauty, love, intimacy, obeying, believing, caring, justice, loyalty, duty. And then we'll have um, uh, in a future episode, we'll talk about this new improved version, which is for the most part quite similar. It's just uh, rethinking that foursome, reorganizing it a little bit um, in a way that um, is you know, has some benefits, basically, technically. It'll be quite a technical thing. Not not to worry about that. And then further research uh, will consider um, all the kinds of places this opens up. But the key thing of today, which is important, is just to start to show, like, anytime you find three of those things, it's it opens up a wealth of uh, ideas. So, uh, and you'll, you'll have noticed... Uh, if you're very attentive and if you're very comprehensive and if you do all the videos, then you'll notice that uh, in the video on divine understanding and human imagination, which was just a few days ago, an academic talk I had given, you can see that I lean into this. So I talk about this uh, learning cycle, taking a stand, following through, reflecting. I talk about the three um, uh, virtues of courage and hope, honesty, which help to keep that cycle from getting stuck. And then I talk about the um, uh, positive emotions, beauty, love, intimacy, which, uh, which uh, let's say, um, strike us, you know, so that uh, it's like God plucking our string, let's say, right? And so then we resonate with these virtues. And that this is all prepared on our inside, you know, when we uh, internalize justice and loyalty, duty as obeying, believing, and caring. And you can see I've actually got these symbols here, like significant, meaningful, memorable. Let's take a look at that. Uh, uh, here is another. Uh, and so this, these just structures just build this whole language of wisdom. And so uh, you'll have um, the body, the mind, the heart, and the will, uh, which relates to, let's say, uh, God is uh, wishes for nothing, is self-sufficient. But we don't wish for nothing. We're not self-sufficient. We have bodies. God wishes for something is certain. But we're not certain. We have minds with doubts. God wishes for anything is calm. But we're not calm. We have expectations and then emotional responses. We have hearts. And God wishes for everything is loving, loves us more than we love ourselves. You know, is able to deal with all this nonsense and just take it as if it was real. And we don't do that. <laughs> we don't uh, wish for everything. Uh, we have like a deepest value. We have value systems where we're trying to sort out what to focus on. So that's what our wills are about. And so we have all these reservations, you could call them. And then if you know that, and if you look at that, see, you can think about it. One of the things that happens is that uh, there are these uh, four um let's say, levels of knowledge with regard to uh, signs. And the American pragmatist philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce uh, brought that up, basically, that like if you have a cat, and this is supposed to indicate a real cat, not just a picture, but you could have a picture, an icon of that cat. That would be one way to represent it. You could have an index based on cause and effect, like these footprints. That would be another way. You could have an abstract symbol, like this Lithuanian word, uh, katanas. These are all ways of uh, science. These are all different levels of knowledge. They all imply a different uh, uh, cognizance. And so uh, one way to think about uh, this that I mentioned in that talk uh, and that I'll want to give uh, future talks about is that not only do you have four levels of signs, but you have uh, six pairs of those four levels, which yield six qualities of signs. And so I don't have those listed here. I'll just rattle them off. They're like signs can be memorable. I'm sorry. Signs can be uh, malleable or uh, modifiable or mobile or memorable or meaningful or motivated. That's the kind of thing. But um, crucial is that, um, as I explained in that video, 
the way we transcend our imagination is to say, hey, it's not just about how things seem, but that there's this world of how things are. And so um, in that world of how things are, like, you know, we empathize with what is, right? So we are, and that all is, and so we kind of transcend just what we're imagining. And so... Um, uh, just to say, like, in terms of these concepts, this, these learning cycle of taking a stand, following through and reflecting gets expressed in terms of these pairs of levels. But also, which is important for today, uh, these um, inner perspectives of obeying, believing and caring. That's what we're going to talk about today, among other things. And uh, this is actually coming up. And again, it'll be a future video on this uh, eightfold structure uh, for the will and 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 uh, I call it the eightfold way. It's related to Buddha's eightfold way, but you also see it in let's say the prayer, "Our Father, who art in heaven," uh, by Jesus Christ. So, um, in that prayer and in the Buddha's eightfold way, I think it's the same. Uh, what you basically have, you say, "Look, let's say with God, you say, hey, God, if I'm in touch with you, I'd rather you think." than I think, you know, you do, than I do, you be, than I be, because you love me more than you, I love myself, you just, you just love everything, like, you have, you're way better at loving me than I am, so I'd rather you do all those things, but a lot of times I'm not in touch with you, so then I go back to checking on myself, you know, I take a stand, and I follow through, and I reflect, uh, and I just hope that you allow that to be helpful, that kind of self-checking, because of course it could be disastrous, uh, it could just go roll downhill, but just watch over me so that I could check on myself. So here's a place where those creep in. And so, oh, it gives a lot to think about. You know, as you, that's the point of this language. Like as you build up this uh, conceptual vocabulary, uh, you will um, see how one piece fits with another piece. It's just like a giant puzzle. And I haven't put it all together, but I've made good progress. And so we're at this point, I'm at this point, I hope that you're at this point where to say, hey, uh, some of this resonates. You'd like to be uh, learning about this puzzle and putting it together. And it's a puzzle of absolute truth. How does absolute truth fit together? So let's now talk about um, caring and believing and obeying. Okay, and they're all rooted in these different value systems, but they can all be thought together. And that's where we started with, how do you follow God's will? OK, and this idea that this is uh, kind of implies that, well, uh, because there's so much to say about God and so many ways to think about God. But this is the God who is beyond me, let's say, I think beyond you. Right. We can also think of God being within us, deep within our realm, uh, you know, our depths, let's say. And then we can also think of those two gods as um, having a shared understanding. And so. In this kind of fluttering where we step in, step out, step in, step out, there could be this Holy Spirit or like a God the lens where this tiny little godling inside of us is matched up and equated with the giant uh, primordial God who is uh, be beyond us. So, but these are relations uh, with this God that's bigger than us, so to speak. And so uh, the ways to follow the will are one is to obey and then one is to believe and one is to care. So what is that? What am I saying by that? I'm saying, look, the simplest way is just to be obedient. Okay. Now we don't like to be obedient, but that's the simplest way. Is just now, of course, I'm kind of leaving aside, like, well, what is God's will? Uh, maybe just to, to say about that, I think basically, and this is based uh, actually taken a lot from uh, Jesus, like the Gospel of John, uh, chasing down the algebra. What is he talking about? Uh, well, who knows, but this, I did my best to figure that out and then relating it to my own life experience. But it's really about uh, living forever here and now, let's say. So we're always having this choice. Do you want to just live or do you want to live as if you were living eternally, growing eternally, learning forever, living forever? You know, like we're in this process of learning. We're not just same old, same old. So life is the fact that God is good. You know that there's something beyond us, this kind of holistic support, like the sun shining on us. And there's some kind of slack, some kind of goodness here that allows us to do our thing, have some freedom, and that they're in harmony. And that's life. That's quite remarkable. Any way you see life, it's basically saying God is good. 
But that's not the important thing about God. <laughs> the important thing about God is that God does not have to be good. Okay, God is bigger than good because good is God within conditions, but God as such is beyond conditions. And so in order to have any kind of relationship or standing with God, you have to kind of realize good is just, a, you know, we good is like our mind, you know, our conditions, the way we think about things. To be able to let go of what we think is good or just let go of the concept of good and say, look, God is beyond that. You know, how does this relate? And see, that just is so much evidence of that. And people, of course, uh, point to that. Um, then it's just true, you know, that um, if you've lived, you know, if you watch, you know, people are hurting, uh, right? And um, people are hurting in ways it doesn't have to be. And it's just not clear, like, what's happening around here? You know, what's what's all this all about? Uh, so those are where we realize, hey, like, God does not have to be good. We have to be good. You know, we have to kind of sort this out, Okay. So uh, that's what that is about. And if you just insist that God is good, you're not helping in a certain sense. I don't think so. I think like and if you've ever wanted to console somebody who uh, really has a great loss, you don't console them by saying, oh, God is good. <laughs> no, you console them, I think, by saying, look, you know, God doesn't have to be good. And you're, you're a witness to that. You know, it's a horrible, terrible, godly thing. Right. It's just evidence of the nature of God. And that's um, that really puts things where we are. So. Um, it's great when we can say, oh, God, God was good, right? But not to say prematurely, oh, God is good. Say, we're here to be honest, uh, brave, and uh, uh, hopeful <laughs> witnesses. So with regard to this very uh, real God, you know, um, obeying is an option <laughs> and uh, not one very... Uh, common to us but so that's one obeying okay now another one and this is the basis for christianity i think like especially maybe evangelical christianity is to say look we don't obey but we can believe and we can believe in one who does obey okay so anybody who's be able to be obedient it could even be a child it could be an old woman or man you know it could be your sweetheart but say hey obedient there's something really lovely beautiful and uh, encouraging about that warm and intimate about that right so so to say oh i'm not going to speak against that and so like you know i believe that i believe there's something in there you know holy and godly and good and obedient maybe i'm not into the politics of obedience you know maybe i want a little bit of freedom to rebel there's there's a whole you know just your choice but you can choose to believe Right? That's another way to go. Say, believe in the one who um, who um, uh, who obeys. Okay, and so you see, like, uh, let's say the obedient one that you know they're going where God wants them to go to live forever. Let's say it's the top of this mountain, right, or the edge of this mountain, right, to live forever. Say, well, they're not there, but they're believing. They they have a straight path there. Just follow. And of course, in Christianity, the whole religion is about uh, Jesus. Uh, the Messiah, the Christ, who um, simply seemed perfect or certainly perfect in the sense of like, well, that's an obedient person who was very just directly obedient to God and someone who we would want to believe in when he says, you know, love your enemy. It's like, I couldn't say that, but he can say that. So I believe based on that, let's say that uh, I want to go though. I want to go there. <laughs> So that is a thing. But uh, of course, uh, people have lots of reason not to believe. And I think if we've, uh, it's just uh, common knowledge. You know, if you if we look at the horrible things done in the name of belief, in the name of Jesus, right? In the name of religion, awful things. Uh, I mean, I'm Lithuanian. We had 200 years of uh, crusades after the crusades in the Holy Land. Then um, was in the 1300s, 1400s. Um, the Crusaders came to uh, Lithuania, Prussia, as, as as it was known and is known, uh, Latvia, and they uh, they were gonna Christianize us. We were the last pagans in Europe, so it was good for them, you know. So that we fought them for two hundred years. You see, and every summer they would come and invade us, and every winter they'd go across the lakes and invade us. So twice a year there'd be these invasions. Uh, and we held them off, and then finally we defeated them utterly in 1410. But in the meanwhile, we we 
took up Christianity finally um, and just became part of the civilized world. So uh, there's lots of reasons not to believe. Uh, my grandfather was an atheist, uh, a communist in Lithuania. He was a villager and that he believed in free education. This was before World War II. Uh, this was illegal. Um, but, you know, it's illegal in a country where you had a one-party system, right? So how, what, what is legality all about when you have a one-party system? It's also a kind of strange thing. Of course, um, to belong to a communist party, which was based on class and uh, really was brutal in that regard, you know, where children in the wrong class are, you know, able to be punished for that. It's a very... Um, it's an inhuman uh, ideology, so it's just strange, like to have a grandfather who wholeheartedly, you know, pursued that belief that, uh, and really thought that uh, uh, religion was just uh, bad, you know, and that uh, he would have. There's a story I learned about my grandfather. Um, he uh, he uh, told, um, well. Uh, a person came, you know, to join the Communist Party. This was maybe when the Soviets, he became a village um, party leader when the Soviets came, uh, the first uh, occupation of Lithuania. Someone came to the village, an acquaintance says, okay, I was going to sign up for the Communist Party. And my father, my grandfather said, do you renounce, you know, God and like the church? <laughs> the man decided, you know, because you will, you know, that's what you do if you're a communist, right? Then the person, think about it. <laughs> I can't, the guy thought about it, he decided he didn't want to do it. So he kind of saved that. And then that person's life was basically saved because uh, he wasn't a communist. And so he didn't get killed by the Nazis. My grandfather was executed by the Nazis. That's life. So um, does God does not have to be cursed. <laughs> Uh, but uh, maybe just to say with regard to wondrous wisdom, like I learned about, I didn't learn he was a communist till I was 15 years old and kind of spotted his name in a Soviet encyclopedia. There was a two liner there, you know, then I kind of, then my father called his mother and she told him the whole story. And maybe just to say she uh, was the Maria Kapuczynska, uh, the most uh, wise and, and wonderful uh woman that I have gotten to be with. I lived with her for four years because she was so wise. After after my PhD, I moved to Chicago and she lived in a black American neighborhood uh, after it switched over. It had been Lithuanian American. She stayed there, uh, unlike most of her neighbors. Uh, and so I came with her and we, we lived there and she, you know, just a wonderfully wise and a human being. So she loved him dearly. So I just thought, you know, it must have been a good person. But, and I can tell he was a, I'll tell about him a story just because um, it is important. This is life. When the Soviets uh, came, so he was there for a year uh, as the party secretary, and then the, not, the Nazis uh, invaded Lithuania. Grand invasion, Barbarossa. And so the Russians said, oh, you know, we have to leave. You have to leave, right? The, Soviets, the, the Nazis are invading. And he goes, uh, you leave. He goes, I didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Uh, and this was after a few weeks after the after the Soviets had deported, uh, you know, brutally to Siberia, maybe one percent of the Lithuanian population, a lot of like school teachers and, you know, army, army officers and people like that, uh, elders of all sorts. So. Um, so that I think that shows his decency, like he didn't think he did anything wrong, <laughs> but six weeks later, he was uh, probably some Lithuanians, uh, I assume. Uh, turned him in, and then uh, he was executed. And then my grandmother, uh, she she could have stayed, but she went uh, into Germany when the Soviets came back and then to the United States. So my parents, uh, on both sides, they, they grew up in refugee camps. So this is just maybe a little bit of a real life stories uh, where this is coming from. When I was maybe six years old, I did know that my grandfather was an atheist. It was a little bit confusing because then she got remarried uh, to my grandfather Kapuczynskas, and um, but they say to him, no, he's not my real grandfather. My real grandfather was executed by the Nazis, and my real grandfather was an atheist. And so then, um, probably at the age of six or so, I uh, said, I thought about like, well, what does that mean? Because, you know, as Catholics, we believe that someone like that will go to hell. I think that's basically the simple of it, right? <laughs> probably the true of it. So 
I just thought that just doesn't seem uh, that just, you know, and I don't want to conflict with God or the church. You know, I've always tried to be careful with the dogma, not to, you know, I just, I'm a, I'm an obedient person. Let's just put it like that um, in many, many ways. So not a hundred percent, but this, I do have that inclination. So the way I sorted it out was to say, look, like, it's all about language. Maybe Kirby Erner would agree. Maybe, maybe Wittgen Science. He's it's like, he, you know, it's not about the words, you know, like maybe he believed in God in an entirely different way. You know, why get hung up on this word God, right? Like he thought about God in an entirely different way, but, but he may have had that whole relationship just in a whole different language. And how can we know unless we went down and translated and like talked to him and learned? And that's the whole point of wondrous wisdom, that there is an absolute truth. Uh, it, it does make sense to have God, but that um, you really have to be sensitive to language and to concepts. Okay, so, but lots and lots of reasons why not to believe, just as my grandfather did not believe, because, you know, you, you see what the church is doing, you see how, uh, in those days, let's say, priests might primarily be property owners, you know, farm owners, you know, they're, or they're, it's all about real estate, let's say, it's all about... Uh, managing property right and so um so do you want to be a part of that right no you know or you see through all that let's say right this is a one-sided view but but there is that one side so what's the alternative well the alternative is like well look if you care about what god cares about now, you may take a very long path. That's why I drew it like this. You know, it's long, 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 long path. But if you care about what God cares about, which is ultimately turns out to be this, I think, you know, this, uh, that we live forever, grow forever, learn forever, here and now. And if we can do that here and now, we're living in a way that just is not of this world. And if we're living in a way of not this world, you know, then dying in this world is not a problem. Right? Because we don't really live in this world. We live in some other plane, right? As you are, I think, by listening to this video. It's not really worldly, is it? So then if you care and you go along on this path, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then um, you will um, appreciate the one who's making progress on that path. You'll see, hey, that person's on the path. That person's on the path. And you'll appreciate that the one who believes is making good progress. There's a lot of assumptions here, but, and then, so if you care, you will believe. If you believe, you will obey, I think. But all secondhand, let's say, right? I mean, if you believe the one, if you follow the one who obeys, is basically ending up obeying. It's just a little secondhand, isn't it? Okay, so we got those, uh, that's really the whole point of this. Now we can, but see, this hooks into this whole system and it hooks into other systems too. So let's kind of look at this. A crucial thing I'm learning about uh, in terms of uh, communicating uh, wondrous wisdom or showing the evidence for that is what I call the three minds, right? So you have a mind that knows, which is the unconscious. And it's like these neural networks, 200 billion neurons, let's say, that all pulled together into a mind that knows what ice cream we want to eat now. Right? Like, and you have a mind that does not know, uh, which is... Um, able to uh, turn it all around into concepts, saying, okay, uh, an apple is what we don't know. It's a word for what we don't know, but represents, let's say, all the kind of things that are related to this thing we end up calling an apple, right? So you get this conceptual language, which might have like 10,000, maybe 100,000 concepts. Uh, a lot of them we have words for or phrases for. And so um, that is um, what they call it conscious, but it really basically doesn't know. It asks questions. Okay, so these words are really kind of like hidden questions, right? Like, what is an apple, right? But let's just talk about these apples, right? But the unconscious uh, has something much more concrete, you know, it's like particular images, particular desires, particular, that are just all kind of bring together. But how do they come together? It doesn't know, I can't tell you. Whereas the conscious puts it in a form where you can start to kind of like figure out the logic. But the crucial thing, you know, so you have this answering mind that knows, the questioning mind that doesn't know. But the crucial thing is you have this consciousness that's able to um, um, balance the two. And it basically holds the break. It tells the conscious, hey, hey, you're getting signals from the unconscious, you know, emotional signals that your models aren't working, right? Listen to that, rework your models, but don't rush. 
Okay, keep reworking. I will tell you, I am the consciousness. I will tell you when to hardwire it. Okay? And that'll happen when you're at peace, when we're at peace, right? So uh, the more I live nowadays, like the more I notice those differences between those three minds, right? You know, you can see I'm chattering, chattering, chattering. You know, I have... I have certain impulses I'm getting from my unconscious, right? And then I convert that into chatter, chatter, chatter. But I have this brain that's kind of monitoring and it's kind of flickering in and out, just saying, okay, uh, you know, don't go too long on this slide. I keep moving, right? So you start to realize there's these different parts and they're, they're, quite, in, they're quite seamless in a certain sense. It's easy just not to realize it. But, you know, sometimes, but you go back to Plato or St. Paul, this idea that there's this battle in the soul, right? Well, that's what the evidence is, right? So um, it's the two hemispheres of the brain, and maybe the basal ganglia is kind of like uh, in between, kind of like, you know, moderating that. Take them out and do your surgery and see if I'm right or wrong, you know, you self-surgeons. So now that, you know, so every time you have this threesome or, or any kind of structure, you kind of see, okay, well, do they match up, right? So I'm kind of thinking that, well, the unconscious is like the one, the mind that can care, right? It just kind of like, just instinctively, maybe just pulls it all together. Like, I'm I, I'm in that mode. That's a, quite a low mode, right? And then uh, conscious is, mind is like able to believe. And so you, it's able to believe in dogmas and dogmas are made of words and concepts, right? And it gets maybe very into that, those types of principles and stuff, right? But the obedient mind is able to kind of like, it basically is able to let go of all those things, you know, listen, manage. But one of the crucial things about consciousness is able to kind of like, just kind of like go back into this little chamber and say, look, shut down the unconscious, shut down all those answers, unplug it, unplug the conscious, unplug that whole conceptual language, that chattering, just sit quietly in the void, right? And when you're in that void, it's actually easy to be obedient, I think. So maybe a good way to instill obedience is to spend time in that void, right? To say, hey, I'm not in this world. Uh, I'm out of this world. I'm in my little chamber. Okay, maybe that's like, so So right there, I think that's kind of interesting theory. You know, like it's a it's an idea that came just from talking with you. So you're important here, right? And very important because you helped me get out of my unconscious mind into my conscious mind, like let go. And then, then I can let go more, right? Then I think that's hopefully I'm having that influence on you. Now, a crucial thing I want to say is on here on this right-hand side. And this relates to the foursome, uh, the four levels of knowledge, but in a different way than... Um, in that previous diagram. So this is kind of curious. There's a lot of research to do. So when we have this whether, what, how, why, one of the ways to think about that is um, kind of like through, well, the people, so to speak, who live through us, right? So um, we're not necessarily even just through us, but the kind of levels that we imagine a person could be operating on. So maybe just to start with ourselves, uh, that we have this choice between living uh, as a person in particular, like what makes us special, like maybe I'm a great chess player, right? So I could say, well, I should focus on chess and I'm going to help out as a chess player and I'm going to win for our team or whatever. Like that's all about me as a person in particular. But there's another way I can proceed is as a person in general to say, well, you know, like um, there's a lot of snow, like uh, uh, anybody well, lots of people can shovel snow, right? And But some people maybe need help with their sh snow shoveling. So I could go out and snuggle, show, shovel snow, right? Um, or pick up a piece of trash or just say a kind word or just listen to somebody, you know, especially if they need a friend. Uh, these are all things anybody could do, a person in general, right? So um, which one is kind of like more important? Okay, you think about that. But those are basically two different modes. The thing that makes us different from everybody and then the thing that makes us the same as everybody, right? Then another is, uh, well, there's God. Like God isn't even a person, so to speak, isn't bound by anything. Like God can just kind of like transcend or live through all of us at, at the same time, you know, and kind of live through the whole world and all the way. I mean, just no limits on God, let's say. Well, God can exist or not, but the crucial thing here is that we can allow for that type of uh, mindset. So if you like, you know, maybe it's the universe, uh, maybe it's being, maybe it's meaning, maybe it's uh, 
love, you know, um, maybe it's electromagnetic waves, you know, whatever you think of as the spirit of everything, right? That would be God, okay? And then there's the world, uh, which maybe is more like that uh, everything itself, let's say, without any spirit, okay? Or, or kind of divorced from spirit, okay? And so in a certain sense, like this type of environment that's maybe upon us, but divorced from our spirit, but just imposed upon us, right? Our conditions, so to speak, right? We're in the conditions of everything. Okay, so I think maybe you have the sense of that. Um, and so the a crucial thing is that morally, we have these three different choices that we make, okay? And they do relate to caring, believing, and obeying. So maybe the first choice is that sometimes you choose between the world and a person in particular. Let's say, like, you know, and maybe this is really in terms of how we think of our lives, right? Like, I can go with what the world would have me do, or I can, you know, approach it to say, well, the world, that's the world. Or I can say, well, you know, there's me like this. I have this person in particular. You know, I have my way of looking at things. And so morally, it's crucial. Like you go with the person in particular. The person is higher status than the world, you know, the, morally. So you live with the person in particular. Then another thing is you say, okay, well, the person in particular and the person in general, like which one would you go with, right? And the idea is that always morally you live as the person in general, right? So, um, you know, so like, you know, you may be a fantastic swimmer, right? And you see someone drowning in the lake, but you go, but hey, like I'm late for my swim uh, practice, right? So <laughs> someone else will worry about that, right? No, like it's not about being, you know, the great swimmer. It's about saying, look, are you a person in general who is going to just do what any good person would do, which maybe would just be yell for help or call for help. But, you know, it could be like asking the great swimmer, hey, go and help them, right? Or maybe even saying like, go swim, like whatever. Of course, be careful if you're saving people because you could, they could get drowned by them too. So, but you can proceed as a person in general, right? And then um, finally, like, but a person in general, um, would okay but how would you would you live as a person in general or would you live from god's vantage point right like in terms of god like let let things proceed from god's point of view right and so which practically could mean like hey like there's all these maybe good things that you can do maybe too many good things you can do sometimes and then at a certain point it's like saying hey like who set this up? Like, I didn't make all this. Like, you know, this is not my responsibility, all these things that are happening. Let's put it on God's plate. Okay. And then maybe that's a more correct relationship to say, look, I'm not going to work on this myself, all of this. I'm going to, you know, however you think about God, but like God is bigger than you as even as a person in general to say, look, I need to be with this child right now because that's my child, maybe, right? I don't have a child, but maybe that's your child, right? Or maybe that's maybe the child who is present. The war in whatever country, you deal with that. I'm going to deal with this child, right? That's a, that's a correct morally approach. That, But that kind of assumes that there is a God who can deal with all these other things, right? Because right now, my little heart says, look, I need to deal with this. That's how I'm playing on the team, right? Okay, so let's relate this to caring, believing, and obeying. So the choice about the person in particular, as opposed to the world, that's saying the value of caring, okay? And so, um, and uh, right, right here, and that's really about the unconscious, okay? So the unconscious is one level of reflection. The world might be like no reflection at all in some sense. The unconscious here is like the first level of reflection. And then to say, okay, but more important than the person in particular, morally, is the person in general. So that'd be the second, you know, not just what I feel I should be doing, but hey, like, what's the right thing to do according to my moral beliefs, right, that are constructed? You know, I'm participating in this moral language. So maybe I need to adjust what I'm doing, you know, or maybe just don't do it, even though I care about this. But to say, no, it's it's more in caring, it's about believing. Do I believe in this? Right? 
And then um, finally, like going from the person in general to God, it's about being obedient. Okay, I think to say, look, it's not about me. It's about the bigger picture. And so I need to be willing to do my part in this bigger picture. So I have to kind of have the notion that there's this bigger picture in me and somebody who stewards that bigger picture, the spirit of the bigger picture, God, truly. So you translate this into your own language, but this is, I think, conceptually, I think what I'm trying to say. A few days have gone by. I'm jumping in again. I had recorded another 40 minutes, uh, and then it turned out uh, that was all corrupt. So now uh, I just can say, you know, God does not have to be good. Life isn't fair. I don't know why it had to be corrupt, but we roll with it. And that's the kind of thing where when that happens, you go, hmm. Well, sometimes I say, well, what's God trying to tell me, right? Maybe he's trying to say, be snappier. <laughs> or, or So maybe it'll be better. That's the attitude. And so um, what I want to talk about now on this uh, chart is uh, these four levels of understanding. There's understanding, self-understanding, shared understanding, and good understanding. And uh, so understanding is a separation, like when God removes uh, God's self uh, in, or and creates God's self, which is the world. So that's understanding. Um, God sees what's going to happen. Uh, but then there's self-understanding uh, where you uh, have self-awareness. You understand yourself. And uh, an example I can think of uh, in the cells in living creatures, uh, there are um, these uh, proton gradients, like electrical uh, gradients uh, and um, where they're pumping things outside into the world uh, beyond the cell and that creates uh, electrical charge and a gradient well uh, what happens and I'm kind of maybe making a little bit of this up is that when you have multicellular organisms you see they don't have anywhere to pump out that proton to so what they apparently do is that they invert everything they have mitochondria, and those mitochondria inside the cell have these membranes, and so then that is where all the pumping takes place. So somehow, like the whole thing, it's like the outer world gets inverted and becomes the inner world, right? So self-awareness or self-understanding is a is a bit like that, like you know where you you have a model of the world, and that's in you, and then you can understand your model, let's say. Uh, so, but that's like I, let's say, and then uh, shared understanding, and that's like this person in particular, but shared understanding would be to say, oh, well, maybe all these other cells out there, all these other people out there, all these other beings out there are like me, and maybe we have a commonality, right? Maybe we, maybe that commonality is more important, it's on a higher plane than, let's say, our particular case, our particular personality. So we can be part of that, uh, you know, greater being in, su in such a way. But then, and so that'd be like you. But then if you look at that from the side, you could say, oh, there's like a bigger picture. Um, and the nice example of good understanding or rapport is um, this asymmetry in understanding. It's the lost child. So if a child is lost in an airport or at the Disneyland parking lot or something like that, the crucial thing for the child, if they're wise, to understand is that, look, I am the child, they are the parent. They should be looking for me, I shouldn't be looking for them. So if I go anywhere, maybe it's best not to go anywhere, but if I do go anywhere, I should go where they will find me, right? They are going to be finding me, I am not going to be finding them. And so that's proper relationship, that's good understanding, that's rapport, that's really exciting when... Uh, a child and a parent have no communication, but because they have a good mindset, they're a, they're in a certain sense they're coordinating with each other without any direct communication, simply because they understand who they are, what they should be doing, what their roles are, what they would expect of each other. Okay, so I can see that uh, those levels here, 
um, when I look at world person in particular, person in general, and God. And then um, with regard to this uh, taking a stand, following through, reflecting, there's a which we subjectively experience as being, doing, thinking. Uh, there seems to be some of that here where uh, caring could be understood as a disposition to do and believing as a disposition to think and obeying as a disposition to be. And then also the, the problems we can have, the, the sins, let's say, the real what are the real key sins uh, to watch out for? So one is apathy. That's when we don't care. And another is idolatry. That's when they're believing, you know, in the wrong thing or, or maybe not believing truly. And another one would be pride when we don't think that we have to have something bigger than us. You know, we're all into ourselves, right? So we, we, uh, we get in the way of realizing, oh, there could be something bigger than us because of our pride. And then the last thing I'll say about this diagram, um, I think I've already mentioned the unconscious, conscious, consciousness, but I want to say I was um, uh, writing um, a magazine, and this is with some of the friends you know, uh, Thomas Gajdasek, Bill Paul, Silvius Pokstas, uh, and uh, Raimund Svaitkavichus. And it was a letter to the enlighteners, you know, the independent thinkers, because it was about uh, self-growth, self self-learning. Well, Silvius... Uh, was in uh, prison uh, in Alitus uh, for many years. Um, he's finally free now. Uh, but um, he invited me to organize seminars for independent thinkers there. And I've been about 15 times or so, I think, uh, over the years. And so um, we're writing a new... Um, we're, we're writing a new magazine with, with some of those uh, convicts. But um, in the original, um, and maybe so far only, a uh, number of the magazine, issue of the magazine, I thought, well, what would be, you know, the thing to teach about the path of the independent thinkers? You know, like, what does it all boil down to? I have experience organizing uh, thousands of independent thinkers uh, with my online laboratory, Minshu Soldas, from 1998 to 2010. So I, I have an experience. So I boiled it down to three steps, which are related uh, here. And so the first is to think independently, you know, like to collect your, th you know, well, to say, first of all, like, hey, um, don't live as if you're watching TV, you know, but to say, oh, this is a thought I'm interested in and save it and then come back to it later. Okay. Um that's actually, I'm studying quantum physics dynamics and all, this combinatorial alternative to the wave function. And actually, there's this dynamic where, like, as you have this growth process, you can say, I'm going to save this for later. So that's what independent thinkers like. It's like they save it for later, and then they have this choice. Do I want to watch more of these incoming ideas, or do I want to maybe pull out that idea, my favorite idea, and think about that instead? And so if you have a few ideas every day, you'll have thousands of ideas and then you'll need to organize them and you'll have projects and then you'll um, uh, have values to, to determine that. And then you'll have a deepest value, uh, which includes all your other values. You'll start to organize yourself. You'll, you'll end up with a personality, which is what this is about. And so that whole process is really about thinking independently. Like, don't worry so much about what your fellow convicts are saying or what the administration is saying. Like, make up, you know, learn to think independently. That's the first. Then, once you know yourself, like the Greeks say, you know your deepest value, but then you can become interested in all these things you don't know. So start to switch over from this mind that knows, like the unconscious, and start to foster more and more the mind that does not know. And so... Uh, become interested in other people. And so find friends um, who would enlighten you, you know, cultivate those friendships, invest in those friendships. That's a thing you can do in this culture of independent thinkers. And that'll, you know, when you think about, okay, I have my deepest value, but I don't know about uh, their deepest value. And that may help me with the questions I have in life. So appreciate to empathize and learn from other people. And then finally, uh, when you have this culture, uh, you may, uh, from, you know, natural, uh, maybe healthy selfishness, want to encourage them to be asking questions and investigating and growing. Of course, I have those urges. And then you have to be careful 
not to be uh, bullying people, <laughs> you know, not to be pestering people too much, uh, but maybe they want to be pestered a little bit. So it becomes very confusing. So then that's where uh, it's very helpful to have this higher point of view of God, right? Uh, to where um, if you put it in God's hands, you say, look, like, uh, am I doing this for my sake? Am I doing it for this their sake? Help me understand the difference, right? So, and that becomes about engaging God, right? So then at, at that point, God is very relevant, you know, for the independent thinker. Now, you can start from that. You can start from engaging God if you're a holy child. And um, in a certain sense, um, maybe I was, maybe you are. Um, that's the obedient way to go. But the idea is that that's, you know, that's not, as I said before, like we don't necessarily have to be obedient, right? And then in terms of being believing, you know, and kind of interested in other people and kind of like uh, interested in what we don't know, like maybe that's not where we are. But this idea, well, at least then start out as an independent thinker, you know, and learn to care about thinking. That was the motto of the Minchu Soldas was, do you care about thinking? So if you care about thinking, that means you're on the path of the independent thinker. So that was a lot on this. Um, and I would just say a few things about um, other uh, components here. Uh, one would be these positive emotions, which would be beauty, love, and intimacy. And then uh, another will be about these internalizations of justice to obeying, loyalty to believing, duty to caring. And here, um, with these uh, positive emotions, what I will be doing, and I, I have an academic presentation that I'll present, so I'll keep this very short, and then you'll get to um, hear that, I hope, in the coming weeks. Uh, but this is an emotional theory based on expectations. So to say, like, uh, I make an expectation, um, and it can be with regard to what's outside of me, or it can be with regard to what's inside of me. So like, if I'm... Um, if I make a guess and I, it turns out to be right, uh, like about an alphabet block or something like that, then I'm excited. But if I'm wrong, then I'm surprised. But if it's something I care about, like let's say I have a sweetheart, right? And uh, and I expect, uh, well, of course, that she's, you know, everything's great with her. Uh, but um, if 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 something happens, I'm reassured, I'm content. But if if something's not right, I become very sad. You know, that it's, it's not right, right? I'm very sad. Now, if something happens on the outside where it's so um, fast or um, just something I wouldn't want, I just cannot make an expectation, then if it's from the outside, it's frightening. If it's from the inside, it's disgusting. <laughs> okay. So that's all. Those are all... Um, the way they are, and especially like sadness and those things, those are all healthy emotions because you're expecting what you want and then you're waiting to see if it happens. And so that's the emo information from the unconscious. It's giving you these emotions, like what's your state of uh, heart, let's say, or state of mind uh, emotionally. But these unhealthy emotional responses arise when we expect what we don't want. So like um, if I... If my bicycle's stolen, you know, well, I'll be surprised, right? If my, that's healthy, I guess. If my sweetheart is stolen, I'll be sad, you know, or, you know, well, well, just sadly sad, you know, which is very healthy. I should be sad. But if I say, oh, no, I suspect that someone's going to take my bike. I left it unlocked, right? Well, then if no one takes it, I'll be relieved. But if someone takes it, I won't be surprised. I'll be angry. And if someone takes my sweetheart, I won't be sad. I'll be hateful. And if someone doesn't take my sweetheart, I won't be content. I will be depressed because I'll wonder, well, why wouldn't they take my sweetheart? And, you know, because I was expecting them to take my sweetheart. So there's something wrong with my sweetheart, you know. So you get into this mental trap. And so depression is a mental trap and that there's a cognitive way to get out of it is to stop expecting what you don't want. Expect what you do want. Spend a lot of time crying and you won't be depressed. That's the that's the thing about this. So the upshot is that um, when I thought about it, like, well, what is beauty emotionally? 
Well, beauty is when you don't feel disgust. And you can't feel disgust if you don't have an inside. Okay, so if everything's outside, what happens is that you can't feel disgust. And slowly, it's like an afterglow. It's You get this building up, this glowing feeling of beauty that, wow, like things are beautifully harmonious or whatever. But it's really the absence of disgust that you're feeling in this accumulation of like this absence. It's just all so beautiful. It's all on the outside. And if you don't have an outside, it's it's a different way. You can't have fright. If you can't have fright, you start to feel this safety, but basically this intimacy, you know, oh, this is so cozy. Oh, this is so like a family, you know, oh, this is so warm. There's no notion of fright, you see, and so you have this great intimacy, right? Whereas if you have a notion of fright in a family, you know, you lose your intimacy. That is not, uh, that is maybe, we would say, like the door to abuse, right? That's, that's not, uh, we don't want to go there. Now, what is the feeling of love? And so this is why these positive emotions are important. Like, they're very important um, in terms of that's how we really anchor ourselves, I think, in terms of like what life's about. So I think that this feeling of love is the impossibility of um, wishing for what you don't want. It's the impossibility of all these unhealthy emotions. You can't feel hate, anxiety, anger, relief, depression. Uh, because, and so if you can't feel that, you start to feel this love, you know, that, uh, and so that love is a, is a wonderfully um, anchoring uh, feeling, okay? So that will be the talk, will be about that, more about that. And then finally, let's just uh, mention about these uh, internalizations, uh, that uh, this idea of meaning of, um, this idea of, of um, meaning of life as harmony, which turns out to be more original than you would think. But um, if you Google that. Uh, but so the idea is that um, justice, loyalty, duty, they're all about this kind of imposed harmony, right? So the idea that justice is imposed on the outside and duty would be maybe self-imposed on the inside. Um, but loyalty uh, would be maybe relating your inside and the outside. You know, it's a harmony imposed between the inside and the outside. And then the idea is that we convert that to where it's not an imposition because it's voluntary. You know, it's an alignment, right? So it becomes obeying and believing and caring. And then to say, I think that furthermore, that would relate to um, these three dimensions of emotion, uh, and this came up uh, when I was doing these goodwill exercises uh, about following the truth of the heart rather than the truth of the world. And what I learned was that the person who's riled up, you know, is always wrong. Okay, so one of the tests for whether I've confused the truth of the heart and the truth of the world is like, well, if I'm all riled up, that means I got it wrong. If you're calm, you're thinking right. If you're riled up, you're thinking wrong. And then um, if you're doing things right, you'll feel good. Okay. If you're doing things wrong, you'll feel bad. And if you're living right, if you're being right, you'll be sensitive. And if you're not living right, you're not being right, you'll be insensitive. So like you don't want to be calm like a rock, you know, because you're insensitive. You want to be calm like a pond, a still one. Like if you throw in a tiny pebble, it will cause big ripples. You know, or, or it's not so important, big ripples, but it's just ripple across the pond. So that's the kind of stillness you want to have. That's the notion of peace you want to have, right? Which uh, basically is maybe more central than happiness. But, um, or at least central in a different way. Um, so right being, right thinking, right doing. And so that may align up like, well, so if you think of obeying as right being and believing as right thinking and caring as right doing, then that will be, um, that should coincide. So we did it. Um, we grounded these, we, we found ways that these concepts come up, you know, these building blocks. And what that does say, it says that this meaning of life structure, it's not inert. It's connecting into different things. And so if you find any one of these concepts, like it could be obeying, 
then all of a sudden, oh, obeying, then look for believing and caring. Look for this idea of following God's will. And then go, and then look for all these other, um, the, 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 the positive emotions. Look for the, um, uh, the, you know, those were inner perspectives. Look for the outer perspectives, justice, um, loyalty, duty. Look for the virtues of uh, honesty, hope, and um, and uh, t -t 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 honesty, hope, and courage. Right? Okay. And see, so that's a huge. Uh, you get you you catch the tiger by the tail. You get the whole tiger. That's the way it works. That's why it's wondrous wisdom. So now, um, for the next episode. Uh, this will be uh, what I've written down here, number five, the new improved version 2.0. You know, I've I thought of these this basic thing I had noticed about 30 years ago, like 1989 or so. But uh, reviewing it, going back, um, you know, you kind of double checking and then uh, rethinking and whatever. Basically, I re I thought you know it's probably better to rethink this in a certain way. So there is a sense in which, let's say. In Plato's Republic, like there's this wisdom, you know, it's the highest thing. Or like with St. Paul, like love, it's the highest thing. But actually, when you think about why and what, see, the way we, so that would be maybe from the outer point of view, when you look at these as levels of knowledge. But the meaning of life, maybe in a certain sense, a, a big chunk of it is the inner point of view. And so the inner point of view is, um, well, we experience those really as emotions, as I've been saying. You don't really, we, it's not about wisdom. It's about experiencing this beauty that the wise person experiences. That's how they feel this. It's about the feeling love, you know, as a feeling, because you really, because um, wishing for what you don't want becomes impossible. So you're on the side of those who, of the of the child, you know, of, of, the, of the one who is just... Uh, 100% for the good. There's 0% of mental energy for, for the wrong, you know, or see, and that's not wonderful. And so that positive emotion is your guarantee, you know, and your reward for doing that. But that's a what, that's what you feel. Why is this all meaningful? You know, why is this happening? It's because of, um, it's because you internalized. It's because of this obeying, believing, caring. Those are the reasons why. This is all happening. So, so then everything makes sense in terms of the structure, and you basically get an, a, a reverse of the normal foursome, if you're familiar with that. It's from how goes to what, uh, that that uh, allows why go to weather. So internalizing would become the opposite, like where why goes to weather. I'm sorry, weather goes to why, and that'll allow God to have a what go to how. And, and the reason it's able to go backwards is because you've colored it with this threesome. The threesome, you know, coloring with the threesome, investing with the threesome allows you know. This is kind of technical thinking, but see, that technical thinking is important when you have this type of language. So that'll be um, uh, uh, more um, more uh, spoken about that, like with pictures, etc. And then another episode, uh, there's all kinds of um, research questions to continue with that. Uh, including with uh, Jerry Northrup's um, language of wisdom, which is the relational symmetry paradigm, and uh, how that could be manifested with, uh, uh, he's having an ecological intelligence, he's uh, designing a timberfish technologies version two, and uh, that has like this autonome. And so in there, you can kind of see like this uh, six sum, this meaning of life. Uh, so fantastic, wonderful. Um, Thank you for um, learning about these things. This is, uh, of course, much about the meaning of my life. It's 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 the the legacy I'm trying to share for a uh, community. So join our investigatory community at mathforwisdom.com, and just to say, like, if you've come this far, you can consider yourself uh, working at the intermediate level of wondrous wisdom, because, you know, you you know the basics, like the threesome and the foursome and the twosome, and now you know how they can kind of come together into more sophisticated things. So, uh, and you can start to appreciate maybe the research questions that are open that you could think about. Maybe you'll solve them. That would be fantastic. That would mean we really have a investigatory community that can uh, think about that. So I wish you all the positive emotions, you know, beauty, um, love, and uh, intimacy. And so um, 
I want to thank you for liking, for subscribing, and thank you for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. And I just uh, pray for the meaning in your life. Peace and love. I was amazed. I went to Patreon. It took me two minutes to sign up. So I was able there to give back some of what I've been given by being a member of Math for Wisdom. It was that easy. Just go do it.